So, uh, so welcome back to the cultures of the left uh, um, in the time of the pandemic, and uh, and happy May first as well. And uh, uh, I just I'm, I'm going to say that uh, my name is Silvia Jestrovic, and joining us today on May first for uh, for dialogues on the cultures of the left in 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 the circumstances of pandemic are um, our comrades. Vishnu Priya Dat and Amit Parameswaran from New Delhi, from JNU, from the School of Arts and Aesthetics. Um, I'm in a Fishek from the Department of Western Languages and Literatures. I did my homework, as you can see, uh, from uh, um, uh, Bogazici University in Istanbul. In Istanbul, did they pronounce this well? Maybe not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Olivera Jokic from the City University of New York. Um, author and scholar Igor Stix from the Department of uh, Critical Political Studies at the Faculty of Media and Communication in Belgrade, and uh, my fellow Boric colleague and a long-time collaborator on this project, Milja Gruhovic of the uh, Theatre and Performance Studies, University of Warwick. So uh, here we are all, right? I haven't missed anyone, no? And uh, we had kind of... Uh, in our uh, conversation about how to do this, we have decided to uh, share three articles that might inspire our further reflections on, on, the, on the situation we are in. Um, and, and also I'm pleased to, to, to say that actually we are going to think about this from very different geographical directions, which might make it interesting. The articles we chose to read was uh, Slavoj Žižek's Barbarism with a Human Face, Judith Butler's Human Traces on the Surfaces of the World, and Arundhati Roy's The Pandemic is a Portal. So uh, the, the, the idea was to start with these articles and then, and then offer reflections wherever, wherever they take us and, they, and, and to use them as a point of departure as much or as little as, as we want or as we need. So, uh, I like to start us off uh, with a with a question, and and feel free to then venture into your own reflection on whatever grabs you, uh, or, or in these articles, or in the situation you're facing, or anything. But since it's it's May the first, uh, reading Butler's text, I was struck with with some of her emphasis on the figure of the worker, and uh, uh, and and I, I was wondering if we. In my first question, if we can revisit this performativity of the worker, um, uh, and uh, on this day, and uh, and I and also we are reminded of the three simple points, three simple demands from which it all started: eight hours work, eight hours culture, eight hours rest. So, how is the current situation modifying these three points, and what are the points you might add? To this. So this is my first question, and <laughs> but also feel free to divert from it into your own reflection if you prefer. So. Uh, is is there um, an order or no? No, just jump in. Um, I I've been um, kind of reading these. Um, status pieces or think pieces all over. Uh, Zizek has appeared, that a version of that piece has appeared in three or four different places. Mm -hmm. um, and the butler I um, hadn't seen anywhere else, but all these um, sort of um, takes on the current crisis um, I'm, I'm starting to sort of watch for the kind of um, writing that um, counts for analysis or what it is trying to do to get us to think about um, what labor looks like, um, what crisis looks like. Um, um, and I'm kind of curious about what the authors or any readers uh, have to say about the uh, insistence on the future or the futurism or um, the idea that we have to be able to imagine some kind of future, um, that the crisis is um, getting us to start thinking about 
um, how we don't have the means of critique anymore um, and that the left is sort of an interesting um, category now. The, um, the Zizek article is interesting to me in the sense that it's uh, sort of making, cracking all these jokes about um, how all the things that we were told were impossible or suddenly possible. Um, but that, that's definitely sort of on one level looking true here in New York, especially. Um, that all kinds of things are becoming sort of available or payable, um, but that it's not clear um, at what cost um, that there's a lot of war rhetoric in place, um, that the government is sort of securing the survival of institutions, but that it's unclear what the institutions are um, and who gets to work for them who gets to maintain them. Uh, so um, I'm sort of just interested in um, what others are sensing of um, the possibilities of actually um, having a critical standpoint or um, being able to, to make plans of action at this point. How is it looking? How is it looking from the from the pers from Indian perspective, of Pia and Amit? How how is how is your context maybe shaping some of the questions that Olya has raised? You want to go more? Or should I? Huh? Yeah. I'll just uh, just a quick response in terms of uh, things are unfolding. Uh, I guess uh, as we are speaking also. Uh, but in terms of the state responses, one of the things that has been striking, uh, and it, a lot of things have been even Shizek, I, I think, uh, mentions, or, you know, there's a possibility, there's always an utopian or a dystopian possibility unfolding, whether it's disaster capitalism, which might follow uh, from what we are seeing now. Uh, but even as it is unfolding, you're seeing, particularly in India, uh, very clearly a, a fascist state, uh, which is sort of uh, arresting uh, activists on the side, even when pandemic is up there. Uh, on one hand, it's yeah, they're seeing prisons have become a space where, you know, there's too much population. That's also the site where COVID could spread, etc. And prisons should be uh, actually loosened. Uh, but then on the other hand, they are kind of arresting uh, activists and uh, people who are critical on kind of uh, flimsy charges. That's one part of it, but also very clearly, uh, because it's, uh, on the question of labor, uh, there's also very strong articulations and proposals coming from the corporate sector to kind of uh, say that the eight hours uh, working condition uh, limits should be expanded. Indians should start now start work for 12 hours, 16 hours, a 60 hour week should be instituted, etc. Which is also very clearly the rights that have been won after long uh, years of struggle. It sort of seems to be pandemic, even though there was some discussion before the pandemic about. Uh, in these circles about the need to kind of increase the working hours of, or the remove the limit of working hours of the working class. Uh, but there's also a very clear articulation now in terms of now this is a war-like situation, this is a pandemic situation, therefore you need to kind of, the corporate should kind of have a, uh, have a full possibility of making workers uh, and work more hours and I guess less pay. Uh, so there's also very clearly attacks on in terms of really statecraft uh, attacks coming which are not uh, really positive in a certain sense, but very clearly anti-worker uh, sense. Yeah, that was just my immediate, uh, even as we are having, uh, in a sense, some of the middle class is having leisure in a peculiar, uh, peculiar homebound way. Uh, yeah, that's nice. mm -hmm. Nilia is in my focus because I'm talking about the situation before we move. Mm -hmm. Emily had a hand. Oh, Emily. Okay. Oh. Yeah. 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 No, no. Have... Please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, we please. can come back to it. No, no. Please come in. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. I was thinking about saying something in response to, to Oliveira's comment. Now I'm thinking about uh, what Amit was just saying um, and speak, thinking of the, the, the kind of the performativity of the worker earlier today. Um, the, 
collective that heads one of the the, the kind of biggest uh, trade unions in the um, in the country. They tried to lay a, a wreath at a monument uh, in a very kind of central square in Istanbul, and this is a traditional kind of uh, May first commemoration. And it's also equally traditional that the the police interrupt. Um, and it is not allowed to actually uh, go through. So the, the members of this collective uh, were pulled into custody earlier today. Um, and of course, you, you know, the logic that is used uh, is that this is a square that has been blocked off, um, at, like a lot, a lot of public spaces out of concerns for public health. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the kind of deep irony of that is that, you know, um, the, the vast majority of workers in a whole variety of really large sectors of the economy continue to work in Turkey. Um, there has been no general lockdown. There is no question even of any form of kind of unpaid leave. Um, so in various sectors of the economy, um, of a kind of a mass industrial uh, production, life continues and people have to labor in, in proximity to one another. Um, so um, the, the kind of irony of the, the kind of call for public health um, at a moment where we might recognize that labor, um, it seems just particularly, uh, particularly poignant and important to note. Um, and it, I, like, like Oliveira, I've been trying to think a lot about and track, so what are the, the kind of genres that are emerging? Uh, the genres of theoretical reflection in response to this moment. Um, and it seems that there's been a kind of shift. Um, the, the three kind of pieces that we read, they all seem to kind of really radically um, underline uncertainty, right? Um, and the fact that we could see, as you mentioned earlier, like a, a kind of, you know, a coronavirus disaster capitalism really emerging full force from this. Uh, but that there might nonetheless also be new forms of social organization that are made possible as well, whose outcomes we can't fully predict either. Um, and that right now we're kind of suspended in a kind of uncertain space for thought. Um, and that seems slightly different from what I saw several weeks ago, where it just seemed like there was a, a theoretical toolbox that kind of emerged. Um, and, um, and I guess I'm thinking a little bit of Agamben as well and some of his early comments. Um, Right. Um, so it seems like they're um, like the, the mode, the genre is shifting. Uh, the vocabulary is uh, it seems to be shifting towards what I don't know. Um, but but yeah, th those are just some, you know, quick responses to, to what the two of you have been saying. I, I mean, uh, maybe to follow, I mean, there are so many interesting trajectories. Uh, uh, the question of uh, what both you and Olivera were asking about genre and about how do we, what is the critical framework within which we think. I think it's one big question that emerges. And the other big question is uh, another sort of uh, various forms of lockdown uh, and and what and and the relationship to the state and power and what do they allow what do they disallow what, what other things they allow in terms of asserting power i'm thinking also of serbia uh, and uh, and the very ambiguous situation there with uh, with curfews and stuff and then also india on the other hand as well with the with the uh, migrant workers left without uh, a means to go home uh, actually and walking hundreds of kilometers so these are all different scenarios but but can we maybe uh, uh, i mean i think we should keep probing as we go the theoretical frameworks because this i think is fascinating but I th but but I, I think also if we maybe think of 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 these scenarios of lockdown of course agamben would say that this is all uh, reduction to bare life and it's not worth it even if even if uh, risking infection uh, it's it's better not to go that route but uh, anyway uh, any any thoughts on this in di in different contexts uh, it's quite alarming what we heard about india and also turkey that this is used as excuses for arrest there have been situations in serbia as well um, uh, so yeah over to you just about the context, if I can, if I can jump in, and, and you mentioned Serbia, where I'm currently uh, staying, yeah, and, and yeah. of course where uh, where you saw it as uh, I, I think regardless of of uh, these three texts, 
uh, that clearly uh, I would underline what you mentioned. It, it, it does um, depend uh, on where you are experiencing this this situation. It mm -hmm. depends mm -hmm. on the local context. It depends on the state where we are in. It depends on the concrete political circumstances in that state, as opposed to the neighboring states or or, or, or globally. And and therefore. Uh, um, um, the, these three texts, of course, uh, they are ad hoc thinking. You know, they may be trying to build a theoretical framework, but things change so quickly that we can't really um, take any of this as a, as a kind of a thought through thing. Even if these texts are written by Butler or Zizek, this is why uh, I, for instance, uh, admire the most uh, the text by Arundhati Roy. Because as a writer, she could, she could jump out of this uh, um, imperative of building a theoretical framework and she could actually paint the picture. And she painted the picture very, very well and very suggestively. Um, what, what are we going to do with uh, people like Zizek who actually published a book about pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's you know? fast. That's really fast. <laughs> that's really fast. I mean, on one hand, one admires it, on the other, you know, I, so I'm not so sure. There. Yeah. It said somewhere that he had had it, he had had the essays done uh, before it actually started, that he had been thinking about this because apparently the a pandemic was sort of the limit case of any kind of thinking about uh, global politics. So he was a man thinking ahead. <laughs> I, I think he's capable of actually producing a book in a, in a week. That's also so, likely. <laughs> yeah. And the problem is, of course, he wrote it in March. We are now beginning of May. Things yeah. change rapidly. And, uh, and of, uh, uh, um, of course, you know, Judith Butler writes what, what, what she usually writes. And she, there is a moral call to, to more solidarity, to bring out uh, this experience. And, and of course, we all agree with that. But we, we also know that politics is not just a moral call that is directed to, to any, any of us. Uh, what, what can we do depends on the circumstances in which we are in, depends on, 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 on society, not only on, on us actually doing something. And although many of us have been involved in various movements, we often did this. We called friends, we started initiatives, and sometimes they were fruitful and sometimes we would be left disappointed because the context did not actually help you in any, in, in any way. Also, we are having problems with now uh, on the left of, of using certain, certain words like solidarity. It's a very important word. And we did a lot of work about, about solidarity within our project. But now it becomes a bit of a thin air. What does it really mean to be, uh, what is the global solidarity? So on, on one hand, there is limits of theory, and there is also the, the problem of, of reality that is now undermining all preconceptions. Um, and j just to finish with this, when I said that the context does matter, of course, there are some encouraging signs. For instance, uh, it did backfire on, 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 the, on the authorities here in Serbia, the, 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 the whole discourse, the lockdown, the uh, curfew and so on. People are banging pots and it became a mass movement over the last three days uh, against basically the dictatorship of, of, uh, of a populist, uh, populist leader. Uh, they know very well that in a couple of months time things are going to be very nasty socially and economically and uh, they are trying to preemptively do everything to actually demobilize people by campaign of fear, control and all these usual methods but they are also very much afraid that this might backfire on, backfire on them and uh, of course they should be afraid the problem is whether they are going to to capitalize on this moment by simply claiming that actually they won the war as you know in many of these countries they use yeah. the word war even in france mm -hmm. you know yeah. And that they won the war with the big sacrifice of big leaders and, and that they are going to capitalize on a new national unity. And that would be a very, very dangerous, dangerous for, for us. And on, on, this, on this point, um, when it comes to the left, wherever we are, we are facing a, a pretty bizarre situation where many of the, 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 the things we advocated for for last 20 years are adopted by right-wing governments. 
yeah? mm -hmm. investing into economy, into public health and so on. How we are going to position within this change environment, uh, I'm not sure anyone has a clear answer. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, it's, it's, it's very interesting and very ambiguous in the sense that I'm thinking also of, a, of, of your mentioning of solidarity and, uh, and what does it mean? And, and then also we're talking about limits of theoretical uh, frameworks. Um, but it also seems that we are facing limits of, of action, so what we can do. Uh, and uh, which, which doesn't mean that we cannot do anything, but, but you know, uh, almost as if we need to rethink, redefine some forms of actions as well. So just thinking along that maybe we need to think of what are these forms of solidarity? What are they doing? On what level are they happening? Um, but anyway, any, any other uh, maybe response? Yeah, can I come in? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. um, you know, it's um, what Igor was saying about, you know, Judith Butler, she's writing what she usually does. And, um, you know, and um, taking off from there. And um, initially, when, you know, this whole thing started, and like Amit said, you know, the middle class went into a sort of a leisure mode. There was this idea that you know it's a um, economic crisis along with the health crisis, so those have to be resolved before you know we can come in or theater can come in or you know we can think of culture again. Otherwise, it's too much of a luxury. Things are so precarious. Uh, until recently, when we were asking people to send in you know their comments, also for the cultures of the left, uh, Maria Delgado sent in a dispatch where important people in cinema and theater industry has been writing to the state in Spain about uh, what will you do to preserve, you know, the culture industry, the cinema, the theater. We account for so much of the GDP, but, you know, you all are proud of us, you all use us, but actually this also shows that you all don't love us. I'm trying to look at Germany and France as the two examples. Um, but when I, you know, try to uh, sort of think of the Indian condition, the Indian government has been a government which has actually spent the least on the crises. They've just given, according to uh, Prabhat Patnaik, only 0.47% of the GDP to the COVID crisis. So culture doesn't sort of uh, come into the whole thing. And... Um, it sort of, um, you know, raises a certain interesting question about, you know, that when everything gets restored, and I think uh, Oliver and Ebony were both trying to sort of point out, um, and, you know, when this gets res restored, it, there's a whole danger that, you know, it's a financial capital which will try to restore itself into a status quo. So it's a, you know, the already exploitative neoliberal system which is going to come back. And health is, of course, important for them. Health is being privatized. Education is being privatized. So, um, you know, the whole financial capital and the sort of global neoliberalism has an investment in it. And in that way, um, you know, theater or the way theater operates in India in a more sort of amateur, unlike the cinema industry, which has a stake in this global financial capital, theater, uh, will, you know, is always finding it difficult to cope with that. So, how does it survive? The state has been taking away funding already. This is going to be really, you know, the sort of the last um, push they can give. They have an excuse for not sponsoring. It was always part of the national project and part of the protectionism of the nation, which of course is now going to be abandoned. And uh, looking at it, you know, the, uh, when I was reading Judith Butler, my last point, where I was sort of thinking of, you know, that older debate where Rustam and Rustam Barucha had this quite a strong critique about people like Peggy Peel. And I think Judith Butler's article has something to do with Diana Taylor, right? It was written, edited by, in some editing by Diana Taylor. That there's a um, need to use a sort of, you know, performance studies vocabulary or a um, universalizing vocabulary for something which, um, you know, without taking into account the local. Mm -hmm. And though I, you know, when it came to that object, I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there was a 
tend to about the skin to skin care to care in a country which has untouchability where all this you know questions of purity the hierarchies are going to be is being reinforced uh, what does it mean you know ultimately and i think there's that whole thing that you know aestheticization of tragedy and finding vocabularies which are universalizing and which goes back to that debate of you know the Rustam had a very strong critique against Peggy Phelan and Jill Dolan and, you know, for um, sort of uh, creating a performance studies universalized vocabulary for nine okay, yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. No, I, I know when, just a little aside we, uh, around that, I remember when we did uh, uh, the Politics and Performance Handbook recently, so uh, uh, I, I remember a Meets article who used the word uh, theatricality and then we asked as editors, oh, can you, uh, um, uh, can you t tell us about s s its meaning uh, um, in the, in the Karelan context? And he said, the word doesn't exist, right, Ami? So, so it's like that sort of imposition of vocabulary, but I find very fascinating what you're telling about what you're saying about the objects and how traces of uh, she was saying about how traces of, of of the labor and the people involved into this transaction are on the object and then what what happens with that in different contexts and and this and the context of untouchability it's, it's absolutely fascinating you know how it sort of um, shifts it differently you know and, and also this whole term social distancing for instance you know is um, it's a very new term, not new term, but it's a new lived, uh, mm. performed term for us. But then it's not necessarily in every context or in every, so there's a class dimension that you're bringing in. And I'm also wondering to build a little bit on Igor as well, on, on Igor's point about how it's different in different contexts in, in terms of um, state, different state. But I think when we think within, even within a, 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 the same context, in terms of social stratification, this seems to be different as well. People are very differently affected. So maybe, I don't know if there are any other comments to PS perhaps, or, or to pick it up. Maybe Milia, would you like to pick up on some of these? Yeah, um, well, just in, 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 in our academic context, I think it's interesting perhaps to, to compare notes. And, and I know that at many UK universities, sessional instructors are being laid off and the notorious case of Sussex University. Um, so um, even here, I mean, Butler talks about racial and geopolitical uh, context and, and how people are affected differentially, but even in, in the academia, I think our colleagues are affected differently. I'm looking forward to the next academic year. Um, and um, so that, that would be something maybe we can pick up uh, on. And also I was struck by Arundhati Roy's comment uh, when she said nothing could be worse than to return to a normality. Um, seeing this as a kind of opportunity that we could seize to, to kind of reinvent. Um, well, to kind of to think about future differently and, and that repeats in, I don't know, Bruno Latour's or Naomi Klein's set pieces and all of that. Um, but I think we all agree that it's really difficult to think it through. And that's why I cherish this opportunity even just to have a conversation about it. Because just the kind of fragmentation that this lockdown in different contexts is causing and, and the lack of information about even very basic uh, issues, you know, in daily lives and, and how technocratic and um, economic elites are running the society and kind of spoon feeding really existential information to the populace and, and pacifying us with kind of reassurances about different aspects of life. And uh, so th to me, that's really, really boring and the extent to which, um, you know, our agency is limited in that way in terms of self-organizing or even fact-finding. Um, and, and finally, I would say, like, in terms of theater and performance studies, uh, I, I saw a um, contribution this morning about German doctors who photographed themselves naked um, and uh, to, to kind of demonstrate the lack of PPI, oh. um, even in the German context, and how French dentists picked up on that, but in a more stylish way, apparently. And, um, and um, I mean, I, I know it's it's really very far-fetched, but it reminded me of, of the Manipur protests that we were discussing 
um, in, in some of our meetings about women in Manipur um, uh, protesting naked. And, and these memes, again, kind of circulating around. Uh, and, you know, what, what are the challenges for us as given performance by these scholars? Um, you know, in terms of our object of study and how, how we can contribute to kind of reflect on the performativity of, of the crisis itself, right? Mm -hmm. These are just some thoughts. I was going to say I'm not a performance scholar, but um, I, I've been thinking about how the crisis will be an interesting um, object or it will continue to be um, an interesting object of study in part because um, of all the performing of concern and authentic feeling in public over the uh, confusions that I think everybody has been uh, mentioning that have to do with the roles of government and um, governmental bodies as the kinds of um, institutions concerned with public welfare and public health um, and sort of the transition from disbelief or um, d lack of interest in um, the virus as a kind of um, thing that actually reaches everyone and does affect public health and does become something that the state is interested in, uh, especially in the United States, um, to the kind of uh, concern uh, that becomes authentic because it sort of wrecks um, the economic uh, grounding of the state. Um, and that um, in the US, it's uh, sort of these um, performative um, political actions are uh, seem to be the sort of most recent development in the last couple of days. I don't know if you saw that um, the state um, um, house of in Michigan was invaded fundamentally by uh, an armed, armed militia. Um, people with semi-automatic weapons uh, were occupying um, the state house um, and basically threatening um, the governor if she doesn't uh, lift the protective measures um, on the grounds of their uh, rights and freedoms being infringed upon. And of course, um, there's the whole politics of wearing masks or not wearing masks appearing in public. Uh, with or without one, um, the sort of um, performance of uh, belief or care uh, for other people's health. Um, uh, I, that to me uh, sounds like a, a great um, place to look um, for um, indications about what the new politics is going to look like but it's not only the memes um, and the, 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 the naked doctors are sort of interesting in the sense that they're kind of taking it um, literally. Um, <laughs> but that um, there's um, an ongoing discussion in this country about what is going to be the next step um, whether loosening the rules um, is um, the sort of thing that we can uh, tolerate that um, the, the public crisis is um, untenable. Um, and of course, there have been people who have been working uh, the entire time. Um, so the, the relaxing of um, things and the sort of the semblance of some life and normalcy um, is um, sort of in the offing or it's being offered as some kind of um, release of political tension, um, but it's unclear that um, we can go back to it because there's the conditions for it just don't exist. The unemployment rate apparently is over 20% in the US now um, because millions of people apply for unemployment every day and there's no small business running or virtually none. So. 
um, sort of small level life and human interaction and performances of um, civility and sort of small economic exchange um, or transactions of any kind are definitely going to change. I think that's going to be interesting to look to. No, it's fascinating about how on how many levels actually we have this sort of performativity really um, from everyday life and how is that going to be shaped mm -hmm. so to these performative gestures that Milia described and then also the the, the sort of our militia you know <laughs> occupying a building a government building and uh, which is we which sounds quite threatening. I mean, I, I spoke the other day with, with someone who teaches in Texas, a colleague who teaches in Texas, and, uh, and uh, uh, from, you know, from also from former Yugoslavia, and we were talking about comparing sort of the lockdown policies, to, so to speak. And, uh, and he sounded actually quite frightened. He, he said there is so much there are so many, there, there's so much arms, obviously, in the US, and if you, if you, if you go more sort of south of the US, more, more sort of the away from the from the east and west shores right uh, that that it really uh, becomes very uncertain not only politically but in term, in terms of how how security is going to be handled so so he sounded quite frightened i don't know if this is your feeling as well olya or, or or not or maybe from new york it might look a bit different i don't know um, here it's very difficult to figure out what the um crisis will look like because there was an ongoing tension from before um, and uh, the conflict now seems to be at the level of um, states versus federal government. There was also an article, it sounds like the federal government is basically requisitioning all the equipment that states with their own money acquire abroad um, and um, that National Guards are being deployed to um, either sort of um, take away um, the equipment or to um, be to serve as guards as at the um, warehouses. Um, the governor of um, Massachusetts uh, had uh, apparently uh, asked the owner of New England Patriots to fly his private jet to South Korea to get a second um, supply of uh, PPE because the first supply was um, literally like abducted by the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, the federal government also sells these things rather than give them away. Um, uh, it's it's a um, it's kind of, to my mind, it's um, sort of playing out what I thought was going to happen, maybe in a different context, uh, but uh, that what happened with the Trump election was that um, a small gang of thugs, um, in a way that reminds me of Serbia too, um, they uh, got um, their hands on uh, the tax revenue um, and the institutions of federal government, and they're basically sort of privatizing the entire state um, in various ways. Um, they already had most of their um, hands on um, the um, state uh, governorships. Uh, there are very few democratic governors. Um, so one of the first things that Trump did when this started was to tell states that they can take care of this themselves, that this is not a federal issue, um, um, which of course is not true, or this is not how the government used to be run. Um, so the, the idea is that um, what's happening here is a complete lack of transparency about how the federal government will want to act or where it will want to intervene um, because um, today it's May 1st, so rent is due again. Um, millions of people are in New York alone will not be able to pay rent. Um, 
which means that all the people who owned their buildings will not be able to pay their mortgages, which like it's going to be a complete disaster. Um, so it's unclear um, how the federal government will want to intervene, uh, except to organize various sort of giveaways in which they gather most of the money um, and we um, acquire it for themselves, um, but in, in various kinds of private accounts. So um, that sort of um, dynamic is virtually impossible to stop at this point. Uh, um, and it's unclear um, where the states are going to get their resources. Um, we're waiting right now. The state of New Jersey has already slashed the budgets for all educational institutions uh, by 25%. Um, this was on top of various uh, pretty radical cuts from last year. Uh, uh, New York State has not announced yet, so we're waiting to hear um, what the consequences are. But the state, unlike the federal government, does not have the recourse to the mint. Um, so because the tax dates have been postponed and there is no revenue for mo most people, it's unclear how anybody's going to pay taxes. Um, but um, the federal government usually intervenes by printing more money and giving it away. Um, this is apparently not happening. Um, so uh, it's, it's unclear. Um, what the financial system is going to look like and how the economy can ever come back from this. So we're kind of sitting and waiting, um, which is why but Butler's argument is nice and like solidarity is nice, um, but um, the entire position from which Butler writes um, is going to become hard to imagine, I think. So I'm thinking of performativity in a way because this is, you know, what what these theatrical gestures, like the doctors uh, stripping to to show that there is not not enough protection, uh, protective equipment and things like that. So how are they going to actually really? How are they going to be doing gestures, doing words in a sense? So I think that's one of the. But you mentioned the financial picture and 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 also going back to both what you were saying and what Pia was saying in terms of culture and, the, and also to the famous eight hours of culture. Uh, uh, now, <laughs> yeah, one 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 of the one of the things that was quite um, there was quite a hyper production of of. Um, you know, artists, musicians, uh, filming themselves, and you know, streaming things for free. A lot of theater. I have a group of friends. I, we watch something every week, and then we meet. I'm, you know, and meet virtually like this and talk theater and stuff like that. So, and then also, I, I remember an email from another friend saying, uh, from Canada, saying, "I don't want after this. I don't want to hear anybody saying." culture needs to be cut we can we have to save on culture we are going to make to cut culture and education this is vital this is keeping our, us sane this is bringing our, our well-being and yet you know indian case the first thing that goes seems to be culture and education serbia is it zero percent igor for culture that's that's budgeted uh what what is the situation in other places what do you think you know um yeah, what, what are your impressions about how, how is this, how is what we do, sort of our line of work, so education, culture, arts, uh, how are we going to move forward in your word, in your views? Where are we at? Big question, I know, but sort of, <laughs> you can answer with another question. I have a kind of maybe roundabout path mm -hmm. to that question. Um, so one of the things that's coming out in a very strong way in, in everybody's comments is that obviously how, how this is being experienced is really, really embedded in the kind of ongoing political and economic catastrophes that are ailing all of these different contexts, right? Um, and this is very much the same in Turkey as well. And it very much resonates with the kind of uh, dynamics of conflict between local government and, and national government in Turkey as well. Um, the, just to give but one example, very early on local governments here intervene to kind of set up charitable networks. Uh, and that's a kind of key um, element in the kind of political lexicon of local government in Turkey historically and something that ushered the AKP into power in the first place. Um, and then the national government uh, put that to, uh, brought that to a halt and said, absolutely not. There will be one piggy bank and it will be national. 
Um, and, and so those bank accounts were stopped. And then the whole idea of donating to the national piggy bank was surrounded by this language of kind of moral collectivity and community so that if you chose not to, um, then, then you were branded a traitor very quickly. So this language is not new in Turkey at all. It's building on almost a decade's worth of political organization at this point. So and it seems like versions of this is, is happening in all of our contexts. Um, and I guess that brings me back to thinking about some of the points that were being made earlier about the theory that has been responding to this, that just as the kind of embeddedness of the corona crisis in existing political networks is inevitable, it just seems as though um, the fact that the voices that we're reading are, their view of corona is embedded in theoretical investments that have been in place for decades, right? Yeah. Um, and endowed fully and completely with, as you were mentioning earlier, their, their own blind spots, uh, their claims to universality, et cetera. So I guess it's, I, I'm, uh, I'm not surprised that that's happening, right? That corona is being through lens that have been in place and that have been honed for over long periods of time and that have now found different kinds of institutional placements across uh, both American and, and uh, global academia as well. So, so I, I'm still kind of thinking about something Igor said earlier about how Arindati Roy's piece stands out here in part because it's doing something else. It's, uh, it's kind of pulling in a different kind of um, aesthetic language uh, and um, trying to do something else with that potentially so that um, we strive towards some kind of new language to uh, begin to understand a, a, a new situation that perhaps these older frames, whether it be a kind of um, uh, Butlerian commitment to intersubjectivity or an Agamban commitment to biopolitics or whatever, uh, some of these will need to shift and change. Um, and I, I guess this is a roundabout answer to Sylvia, your question. I feel like likewise here as well, there's been all this kind of cultural production um, and very little of it in terms of content has taken me off guard. Um, a lot of it comes out of existing political aesthetic commitments from very identifiable corners of the artistic spectrum in Turkey. I've loved them and enjoyed them, um, but I feel like they're kind of, they're struggling very much to kind of survive right now and announce that they're still here. We haven't gone anywhere. Uh, and likewise, the financial strain is very strong in Turkey as well. So I can't help but think that some time will be necessary before potentially a new idiom uh, comes out of this and begins to grapple with our new reality. Um, and I feel like it's important that we underline that time is necessary um, to come back to the question of academia because I'm just so fearful that when all this is over, um, we're just going to have to really uh, keep agitating for like a slow academia, uh, right? Because I feel like all these imperative source efficiency, Zoom, online teaching, all of this, these things are going to just haunt us uh, in different ways, obviously, depending on context. So we're going to have to make like a renewed emphasis on the fact that scholarship, theoretical thinking, conceptual thinking takes time. And, you know, um, so anyway, so I feel like the, the idea that there's like an elongated potentially impasse here and sometimes maybe a luxurious impasse, I don't know, that seems something to kind of safeguard or, or at least underline that it's important. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That is very important, I think. Mm. Yeah, extremely important. Any comments, further comments? Mm. Well, I'm just thinking in, in the most immediate period because um, you know we don't know when this crisis is going to, to end. I mean, even the corona crisis, let alone the, the kind of the, the aftermath of that, uh, financial and otherwise. Um, so, you know, the, the, the most immediate thing is like this summer, we'll end up planning our classes for the next academic year. And, you know, we don't know how, how that's going to unfold. And I, I'm just thinking, you know, what kind of competencies we'll be asking our students to develop in that period and, you know, how, how we go about um because everything has moved online they produce in our video works and mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's a default kind of position for them to just kind of end this academic year at least in our discipline um but then what what kind of expectations will be having from them in the next academic year you know, what kind of skills will be teaching i mean i i don't think that we can just go on as usual. And I think these conversations will be had in the, in the following two, three months. Um, and, and 
for me, that would be something if we continue with these meetings, maybe even more kind of concrete issue to, to share, uh, to, to share just institutional experiences or, or good practices or, or just ideas how to position ourselves in negotiating that with, with, with the universe. Um, th this is what I'm just wondering about. And, and actually how that part of that is also how we make ourselves relevant and our work relevant, right? Um, and, and entice students to just continue studying what they were going to study. <laughs> if that's even fair to say, yeah. yeah. There was um, an initial response to our move online um, that a bunch of students just dropped out, um, mm. literally disenrolled yeah. uh, and never came back. Um, and whoever was uh, supposed to transfer to teaching online was kind of doing it reluctantly. And um, some people try to resist it and kind of just say, I, I don't do this sort of thing. And that of course didn't go very far. Uh, so I imagine that there's a lot of very shoddy um, instruction going on because nobody's prepared for this. Um, and I've heard from uh, friends in France um, that they were sort of staging actual quote unquote strikes that they were just refusing to move it online, the teachers, um, because they thought it was a meaningless exercise and that it was sort of pretending um, to be education when it actually wasn't. Um, and there were memes and all of that. Um, uh, but uh, it's uh, also, I'm, I'm starting to hear questions from students about like, is it worth going to grad school? Um, what do I do with this degree? Um, they were hoping to have some kind of a pro research project by the end of their senior year. Now they have nothing or they have something sloppy. Um, it's, I think it's going to be necessary to figure out uh, where the, um, thinking about education comes from. Um, and in some ways, I'm not even opposed. I, it's definitely a, a, a grave risk to our positions and our livelihoods. Um, but there will be situations in which I think it will look like um, nothing is better than the sloppy pretend course uh, or the pretend education. Um, that a lot of this is about continuing the revenue stream for the institution, um, that we won't get um, to examine um, what the salary structures are in the institution, how much administration we have, um, what kinds of student services were available, uh, what will not be available anymore, what the living situations are uh, for a lot of our students. I believe a lot of our, our students disappear because they live in households that, that are cramped, um, where they have no internet. Um, the university had to distribute um, um, various instruments of learning. Um, the New York public schools the same way. Uh, the New York public schools also became uh, the places where uh, students at first could come and get their meals because this is the place where a lot of New York public school students get their only meals in the day. Um, now uh, anyone can go and get a meal from a New York public school. Um, I think there, it's going to be sort of at, on the existential level, there's going to be hunger in New York, especially. Uh, very soon, um, and I'm sure in other places in New York where there's a large concentration of poor people, um, the working poor, especially the people who are sort of barely making do when they had jobs and now that there's no service industry, um, they have no jobs and no other way of surviving. Um, so I think education and culture are going to be a new thing. Um, I, I'm not sure what it's going to look like, uh, but I'm also um, interested uh, in seeing how much we can um, 
transform our own ideas about what our work is, uh, what it means to be theoretical at a time like this, um, what should be or could be theorized, um, or um, I'm not sure. I, I, I think it, I mean, it's right that um, some sort of um, patience for, um, clear, for in, the, in the name of clarity or um, figuring out what's going on um, is necessary. And also, um, I don't think we're ever going back to anything. Um, um, it's all going to be new and new every day. Um, so a lot of watching for how it changes um, is what seems to me to be the next task. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think also very interesting, this is almost like a new, ne our next topic emerging, perhaps thinking about what would be a leftist pedagogy or pedagogies in this context. Uh, uh, I'm mindful that we are kind of nearing the end of an hour. We can go on more if we want, but, but I'm just wondering that maybe to, to kind of round it up, if we sort of make a little bit of a, Pia, do you want to say something? Igor, Igor wanted to speak. Ah, Igor, come on, yeah. Uh, well, of course, uh, thank you, Oliveira, for this update about the US and uh, um, uh, Clearly, the problem with the U.S. and the U.K. is the, the entire structure of, of the capitalism you have there. So it's a total nervous breakdown. It's people losing jobs and they're they 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 are literally hungry. Now, we coming from different regions, being in this crisis for, I would say, last 40 years, which coincides with my life, which mm -hmm. is... <laughs> and, and basically, we could say, you know, since Tito died in that fateful year, 98, he, all, all been downhill from crisis to another crisis, a bit up, then down, up, down, and so on and so on, which of course uh, taught us to, to live at various levels uh, uh, and uh, to live with, the, with the little and nothing and to live also comfortably with, with a bit more. And uh, this is this is where where these local differences will also play play a role. And of course, this is not to downplay uh, the, the 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 dramatic situation we are going to face. We all know that the crisis usually lead to violence and so on. But uh, this is why maybe the response has been been also quite quite different to this to this pandemic, also at the at the personal level. Uh, I mean, we've been discussing over the last 10 years, uh, 20 or more, about the indebtedness of a regular American. So nobody did anything about it. Obama didn't do anything about it, as you know. So it's not only Trump, as many of our liberal friends would like to believe, uh, that everything was perfect before, before it wasn't. And now we are going in the most, the richest country in the world, we are going to see hunger, we are going to see violence, we are going to see a, a, a complete social, social disorder. Uh, now, the problem is this is also the, 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 the country where the left is not present and where the only hope for the left was, of course, projected into one person, which was Barry Sanders, and, and he did a wonderful job of rehabilitating some of the discourse that was legitimate in America, say, 100 years ago. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, 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 the problem with the left is also to then play the game of the system, which is a presidential election. It's a two-party system. It's not even a multi-party system. It, it, there is a problem with democracy in America, with capitalism in America, where there's a problem with, with, with neoliberal dogma that managed to then be uh, of course, spread uh, 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 across, across the world. And, and clearly, they were, it would be very, very difficult now in, in, in the UK, but also the US, to actually pull out the traditions of the left and to inspire yourself with them. Because it's been, it's been so long. It's been gone for, four, for at least 40 years of the neoliberalism, but in America, for, uh, even more. And the only thing we could hope for at the universities and, and in culture is that there will be a new deal, which means that as a part of a social, uh, um, social help and social care, uh, the state will pay our salaries and will employ artists and, 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 and writers as, as it was done during the new deal time.
and it will be a type of a social aid. So we can only hope for that, that they are smart enough to say, look, uh, all these unemployed young people, put them to universities, give them small stipends, pay these teachers, doesn't matter, let's do another massification of the higher education just to move them from the streets. But for that, we would need a completely different thinking about what, what is the social state and what is a new social contract. And that does not work well with, with neoliberalism that for me now reach its death, but it doesn't mean that it can't live on. It's a zombie that will that will live on, as we can see. The right. ideas, are wrong. Hmm? yeah, exactly. So, so basically, I think we are going to face a very confusing situation, also for 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 scholarship. Like, I mean, you know, in the UK, also I worked there. Uh, what panic was about the the the, the ref. And, and who is going to judge our output now and so on. Everything was just revolving around that. Not to uh, mention the metrics. Did you publish here or there? Is it three points or five points which been used in continental Europe? I mean, that's all, all gone. And whoever believes and wants to keep this system is, is crazy. But we, there will be a, a total confusion over the next couple of years. And it is a portal. I mean, certain things must happen over the next two or three years uh, that will define the decades to come. But are we, go are we going with our ideals and with our uh, traditions of the left and, and, and um, uh, the ideas how we see society? Are we going to define this? Well, there clearly I'm, I'm quite cautious, although I, I have to remain optimistic. Well, this is a very nice optimistic note. I just <laughs> I like to actually, uh, uh, because it, both you and Oliveira uh, brought us back to the context and the, and the state and the different states, different context. I'm just uh, 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 briefly would like to go back to India. And I was thinking as the crisis was unfolding, there is Modi's India. And then I was reading, and this is my superficial reading from far away, uh, about Kerala that we, some of us had the pleasure to visit and enjoy. Uh, with our left projects, not just on holiday, um, that 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 Kerala was handling it, the only sort of left state that is left in India. It looks, it, yeah, was handling it differently. Was handling it better. So. Uh, 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 it seems to me that we are starting, so is my, was my reading okay? I'm asking my Indian colleagues, but also, you know, do we see now a correlation between, you know, um, the kind of states, uh, right, or, you know, whether, whether we are sort of left central or right, and the way the crisis is handled. So, so have the, the overall, do, can we say that perhaps those that are more sort of left, cent, center left or left have handled it better than, than the right-wingers we, we have? Or is it a too, too blank of a statement? Amit has to come in, it's his end. Amit has to come in about Kerala. Just, or you, yeah. quick, uh, just a quick response in the sense that it's also May 1st. Uh, it's also happy that you know, Kerala does not have a fresh case today. From today on, I guess. Today we don't have a fresh case. So, so that's a real, real positive in a certain sense. And it's May 1st. So it's quite nice uh, because it kind of goes back to a lot of struggles that have, I, I guess left played a huge part in that uh, in terms of really having a very good medical uh, facilities, healthcare, uh, being a premium in the state all the time. Uh, and also very clearly that, you know, really wonderful state craft. Uh, Shaila is the teacher who was the health minister. Uh, she has been kind of really, uh, really up, you know, right from the first case in India was uh, in Kerala from students from China, from Wuhan who had come. Uh, and so it was kind of really Kerala was the place where it started in India. And now it's almost like, you know, at least they claim it, they have flattened the curve, etc. Uh, so that it does, so it was very interesting to think about. So on one hand, the, we think of uneven development, uh, which is kind of really critical, critical when we think about uh, vague capitalism functions. Uh, but also there seems to be uneven uh, in terms of welfare that it does not uneven development is not folding on to uneven uh, you know social development in a certain sense and that in crisis like pandemic or floods which kerala went through the year after we kind of landed up so kerala had nipa then it had two years of flood and now this one but it is surviving and it's surviving quite well because it's almost like a 
machinery which can actually deal with social machinery which can deal with pandemics or any kind of crisis in that sense um, seems to be more empathetic uh, but also more you know more in terms of following the processes kind of having vision trust of the leader which is, seems to be quite interesting which i think is a common story uh, now seems to be everywhere in the sense that i think arindati roy says that you know, uh, she just passingly states that the regional states have been more empathetic than the national one while modi is doing spectacles like you know uh, bang the pots or you know just in support uh, or go and light the lamps one day uh, and do and today military general has come out said that we will pro you know we will have a helicopter putting down roses on hospitals these sort of really empty gestures complete uh, you know just mm-hmm. symbolic ones with actually nothing there uh, but the regional states have been much more uh, on the job at least more caring humane and empathetic in the response and i think there is something about the state craft uh, definitely the left legacy of having, having things in place which is some claims some rights of people uh, is kind of really making a difference and also kind of really just having some can kind of compare with new zealand and other places so is it social welfare state is there something of those uh, more democratic in i guess in in spirit which allows you to be more empathetic to deal with a pandemic lockdown i suppose yeah so that was just a, mm. Mm. i yeah i think it's it's a maybe uh, a good uh, way to end the political aspect of it with igor's new deal and with amit's uh, uh did you say social machinery that can heal itself that can heal heal itself yeah can... at least yeah that's, that, that's very that's very nice i think we need we need that um uh, any any final thoughts any anything else and i have a little final question for everyone after that after that but if anyone wants to have any response to and i i just i keep thinking uh, now that amit has said these things about uh, <laughs> dropping flowers on the roofs of hospitals um in terms of uh sort of the modeling on responses and uh the spread of the neoliberal modeling um in statecraft and uh, empathy um a lot of these measures uh look like um both in serbia and what i hear about india um it sounds like um the government sort of um assigns the citizen citizenry to um, um deploy various measures of public uh, compassion that have been first deployed in new york and uh, the the banging on the pots and whatever and shouting from windows and balconies uh, i hear was recommended in india and it first started in manhattan at some point uh, early on um and i live in brooklyn east of prospect park in what's historically a black neighborhood uh and in my building live a lot of nurses and so when somebody started or tried to do this early on uh somebody came out of the window in my building and said shut the fuck up um so um the limits of compassion <laughs> are also here um it's just not covered in the news as much mm. yeah that looks yeah it's fascinating so shall we end then with the with the i i because it's also uh, it's it's one of those that there is this big political picture but then there is also this situation when we are all personally uh, sort of coping with the day to day reality and and i must say probably all of us who have the roofs over our heads and you know our screens and our you know some kind of security even if it's not the greatest you know are probably i mean all of us who can stay home and save lives are okay i suppose because there are lots of those who cannot but i for for the end i just thought you know it would been i'd like to hear how each of you perhaps you know what, what, what you know a little everyday detail how are you coping what are you doing it can be from intellectual and political pursuits to baking anything so i just want to have a glimpse and i think we all enjoy some glimpses into into your lockdown life it can be political it can be personal anything or a mixture I signed up for uh, an unlimited month of yoga 
um, I agreed to participate in some sort of meditation, a retreat with a friend of mine from Belgrade. Um, I uh, teach my classes. Uh, one of them is a PhD class at the Grad Center. Uh, uh, I said to everyone that uh, everybody gets an A, um, same with the undergrads. So if you need to drop out, you can drop out. Um, but the point is to sort of come back to some things. They have something to think about um, that isn't how you could get sick. Um, several students had either their own illnesses or partners or parents had to go somewhere, come back. Um, I have uh, at least six streaming services uh, that I signed up for. Um, four from before, two new ones. I watch something for hours every single day. Not great. Um, I read more than I didn't. Um, and uh, I was going to send you, um, I have, I bought some masks yesterday that I wanted to recommend in case people were into it. Uh, let me just find the link. Uh, okay. okay. Send it to us. That could be. Yeah, yeah. I will. As well. <laughs> so um, how about Pia? Okay. Um, we've, um, were very determined that we did not want to move education online because we felt it was very discriminating. So a lot of the lockdown has been trying to negotiate with um, the JNU administration, who, as you know, is very erratic and very right wing with the government and, you know, how to keep the education system, particularly what JNU represents a public education system in the democratic way it is. So, um, there's been a lot of efforts in trying to disseminate the material, but at the same time, not do online classes or online exam, but also try to think that, where are we going? And personally, I'm writing a play. So I'm writing. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. fabulous. So, yes. That's fabulous. So, yeah. So if I don't have a university job, I can go back to work there. That is wonderful. And, and we want to have a reading, mm -hmm. at least, and, and not online. <laughs> Milia, your silver lining <laughs> of the lockdown? Well, I, I, I think we will all agree that this lockdown affects differentially single people. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> 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 <That aside. laughs> um, and, um, well, you know, uh, I am finding that I'm, I'm in touch with postgrad students more than, than usual, and, and this is the time when, when they really trying to write their chapters and, and trying to support them and have online meetings. And uh, luckily, we, we kind of finished with undergraduate students, at least uh, the former part in terms of teaching, so it's mostly assessment now. Um, and for my own sanity, yeah, I try to see a film maybe uh, every evening or every second evening. And um, I use the platform Movie uh, MUBI that has lots of good films, but Oliveira is sending also some other tips. Um, and, um, and finally, I picked up on practicing basketball again, and, and it's something oh. that you can do on your own. So I go to um, park that's pretty much deserted and there's a basketball court and, and, and then I practice on my own and it's fun. Amine? Um, I, I guess, okay, I guess a couple of things. Likewise, I kind of have like the seeds of a creative project going. Um, I've kind of had like a, a fantasy second life where I'm no longer working in academia, but pursuing all kinds of writing projects. Um, so I've been trying to uh, I, I've been having a hard time concentrating on, on anything other than just basically the day-to-day -day necessity for teaching and teaching prep. So I've been trying to like think a little bit more methodically about what I want to do and putting some, some ideas down on the page um, for but potentially writing something and collaborating potentially with a couple of friends. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of kind of creative energy that is going into that, but it's on and off, on and off, on and off, depending on the day. Um, but overall, this has been um, like a, I, 
a large part of my adult life, I lived in the US and I still have a lot of friends there. And it's not always very easy for us to keep in touch because of the time difference. Uh, and with the usual kind of uh, rush of everyday life, we have difficulty coordinating hours. But now that time <laughs> is working very differently and melting literally all over the place, um, I'm finding it, we're finding it a lot easier to, to just catch up with friends I haven't been able to speak to in a long time. So there's been these, you know, these moments where it's been wonderful to have, you know, voices back in my life that haven't been there in a regular way in a long time. Uh, so that's been it, I guess if we call it that, a kind of silver lining. Great. Igor? Uh, yeah, it's uh, um, with a, with a five-year-old at home and uh, being uh, under strict lockdown police curfew even today on the May, May 1st, uh, it, it, uh, it happened that I went back to radio and uh, I, I usually li listen to, 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 to French radio, especially France Culture. And uh, the, this is where you see what the good state funded the radio could do and how important the radio is, as, uh, as, a, as a form and technology is. So to, to listen things, it, it became actually quite much more important. Actually, the problem of concentration, I can't really concentrate for too long. I can't read too much. I, I, I can't write many things. So the voice somehow be, became important. So on one hand, I'm listening a lot of radio. Uh, uh, um, and on the other hand, uh, it so happened that in the, in the Balkan regional media, somehow uh, what I was doing over the last one month, I was giving a lot of interviews, which is a bit bizarre because I have maybe five arguments. I don't have 15 arguments. I can't really say anything original. Uh, after after one or two interviews, but there was a lot of interest uh, 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 about specifically questions we discuss here. What's going to happen? What is the left, um, and and so on. Uh, what is the role of art? And uh, there, I started to reflect on the more of uh, of voice again. What do we say actually in public, rather than writing? We've been so focused on writing. It's an old debate. We all know between voice and, mm -hmm. and, and, and writing and so on. What is the, the real thing? What is authentic? What does it mean to, to think aloud in public? And uh, so therefore it's been, it's been voice for now. Great, thanks. Amit, are you in Kerala, Amit, by the way? Where is Amit? No, he's in Delhi. What about you, Sylvia? Oh, yeah. well, um, uh, T t again, time is kind of, I don't know, it kind of spread strangely. So I'm very busy in a way, but in a different way. And everything melts into everything else. So I have a teenager, not a five-year-old, but a teenager who uh, sometimes, not always, but you know, there is a lot of uh, printing, assisting, planning schoolwork, homeschooling, panic, uh, ticking the box that things are done during the day. You know, there's a lot of that pressure. Uh, there is the university thing. There is, so I, sometimes I feel, okay, where is this? People are talking about killing time in this and I cannot find a, 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 you know, a, a way how, you know, I, I want my moment of killing time. And, and I had all sorts of thoughts what, what I might do, but actually I'm just doing the daily things, but in a, in a more, everything, everything melted into the other. And, um, uh, but but uh, Olivera mentioned yoga and, and maybe this will illustrate my, my sort of position. I do occasionally yoga and also uh, go back to Igor's radio, to Radio 4 which is a bit perverse because depending on the time of the day you never know what is going to come through it you know so sometimes i have ian mckellen reciting english poetry fair enough other times i have the news uh, reporting on, on the latest death toll uh, of covid uh, uh, patients the chronic and criminal lack of equipment for the medics and so on so i think that kind of illustrates my my things and i walk I walk around the area. There are lots of fields nearby, so that's a bit of a saving grace. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's that. Um, I thank and you. Amit. 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 Sorry, I, my internet had gone off. So ah, just... ah, are you back? So how, what is your? Are you in Kerala, Amit, or in in? in uh, no, Delhi? in Delhi, unfortunately. Yeah. So what is your? Yeah. Silver, <laughs> give us your silver lining for the end. Uh, nothing. Cooking and cleaning and some reading. I'm thinking. Well, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Reducing, reducing smoking. That is a silver lining. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> well, I 
think there is a lot for us to take away from today. I will certainly take Slow Academia, Igor's yeah. New Deal, the social machinery that can heal itself. I think that's enough for May 1st. And I'm considering moving to Kerala. <laughs> <laughs> That's really a fantasy, a lockdown fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Lovely okay. to see you all. Thank bye you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. 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 bye.